Hi, and uh, welcome to the first presentation of 2016 of the seminar presentations that I do here in Hopkinton at the Council on Aging. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen these before, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I, had work, I work at a firm called Myrick O'Connell. Um, there are 60 of us in the firm, uh, 20 in Westboro. We're actually the biggest firm in this area, and 40 in Worcester. Uh, because the other 59 do something else, I get to do just elder law, which I love doing and have been doing for a long time. I will have been practicing 40 years next year. So this presentation is different from the others that I have done here in that I am not here trying to explain to you a piece of elder law, a piece of how mass health works or uh, qualifying for other kinds of benefits or estate taxation or any of that. Instead, I'm talking about something a little bit broader. Um, it relates to my friends um, Frank and Mary, whom you have seen before. Uh, you know my clients Frank and Mary uh, and their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Um, and I always tell people if you get that joke, that means you're old enough to be my client. That, that their goal in life is very simple. They want to uh, live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And the question, and most of the people that I have mo as clients are people who are like Mary and Frank. Um, but their concern is, what if one of us gets Alzheimer's or another disease that causes dementia? How can I stay in my home? And there are some issues around just staying in the home, but then there are broader issues around staying in the community where that home is. Because you don't just live in your house, you live in a place. And the question is, how can you do that? And communities now aren't well adapted to that. So I found myself, because I do a lot of this work, and I started doing this work because my mother died in a nursing home after she had been living at home and getting worse with dementia, and my dad still be at home, and I saw all of that tension and saw her hide, saw them both hide in their house because they were embarrassed that anybody would know that they had dementia. And so I found myself saying, so how do we deal with this? So we spent some time um, looking around. We talked to the folks at the Alzheimer's Association here, and we found that there was an initiative in Minnesota, uh, started several years ago, in which the, the, the state has been providing some funding to individual communities to try to figure out how they could become dementia-friendly communities. Um, we were so interested in this that um, Myrick O'Connell sponsored a trip. We went out, I did, and the Council on Aging directors from Marlboro, Hudson, and Northboro, three contiguous communities, I live in Marlboro, um, went to Minnesota, went to Minneapolis, actually spent two days of training across the street from the Mall of America, so we got to see Mall of America, but at the same time, we got to find out, first of all, whether this was all smoke and mirrors, whether there was any substance to this, and we found that there was. And so we decided, after the training, when we came back, there, were, there was me and the three Council on Aging directors and a woman named Christine Alessandro, whom, many, whom you have met before. I've brought her here. She is the executive director of Bay Path Elder Services, which is the, 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 the nonprofit entity that deals with, provide, with kind of funneling state and federal elder benefits to people in 14 communities, including Hopkinton and also including the three towns that I mentioned, including the city of Marlboro and then Hudson and Northboro. So we came back and the, and the COA directors were all really pumped up, we all were, about, about seeing if we could do this. And so all three of them have now started this process and have actually organized teams that are starting to work on figuring out how each community uniquely can become dementia friendly. But, the, but in the course of that, folks, and I'm on the team actually in Marlboro, and, and I find that people like me find ourselves saying, so what does that mean? Dementia in the community sounds great, what does it mean? Because to me, it, what it means is that my friends Frank and Mary can live in their house until they die, which means no matter how old I get and no, no matter how confused I get, I can still be living a happy life. And so we're talking about Mary here, what if Mary uh, got Alzheimer's or one of the other diseases that causes dementia. As we've talked about before, Alzheimer's causes about 70% uh, of the cases where folks have dementia, which is why often people confuse the two terms. They literally think of dementia and Alzheimer's as being the same thing, whereas dementia is really not a disease, just a set of symptoms, roughly defined as symptoms having to do with memory loss, getting more and more confused because your memory is working less and less well. So the question is, if Mary Gets, a, gets Alzheimer's, um, how can she be staying at home with Frank? Now, we're not talking here about the cure. You hear a lot about the cure. Every, last, yesterday I was at Dunkin' Donuts and there's, the TV is on and I'm watching ads about 
memory pills. Everybody, everybody, every big drug company is trying to tell you that they've figured out the cure. No one has. They're all saying the cure is around the corner. I don't believe it. Um, maybe that would all be great, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about facing the reality of if you have dementia now or in the near future, what are you going to do? Like my older brother, who is 78 and lives in Maine and just got an early stage diagnosis, right? Or my sister, who is 81, who is on top of her game, but she's taking care of her husband, who is 83 and has, has a serious diagnosis. He's serious, uh, but he's still at home. So how does it affect these folks, right? So certainly, we have talked before, I think even here, about making your home dementia friendly. I think we even brought in a woman named Carol DiRienzo, who is a nurse, uh, and, and she always refers to herself as the nurse carpenter. She and her husband have specialized in this niche of going into homes where someone has dementia and trying to figure out how to make the home safer, more dementia friendly, dealing with making sure that the stove automatically shuts off after a while so the house doesn't burn down, a common problem with folks with dementia. Um, or that people don't drift away because there's some kind of locking system and that you're getting rid of clutter and making the house simpler. And those are all great in your house. But the question is, for a lot of people right now, how can we make it so that you're not just stuck in your house? Because for a lot of my clients, that's what's happening. They're simply staying in their house because they're afraid to go out and they're embarrassed to go out. What about the neighborhood? In a dementia-friendly community, what's the neighborhood like? Well, among other things, Everybody in the neighborhood in a dementia-friendly community knows you have a disease that causes dementia if you do, if you're married, because you're not embarrassed to tell them that, right? And those folks all know that it's not contagious, so they can talk to you and not catch dementia. Um, and, and also they know that they can have a conversation with you. Um, recently, we were doing a presentation um, um, and um, the person who runs the Council on Aging in Hudson spoke. And she had also been a caregiver over the last few years. Lived in, her mother lived in Chelmsford, and every night after work, she would drive to Chelmsford to stay with her mother overnight, right? She lived in Marlboro, but her husband was okay, and they said that was what, she's the designated daughter, she did it. And, I, and she would say that she, would, she remembers talking to old friends of her mother's, because her mother was a very social person, who haven't, hadn't come over, saying, you know, it'd be great if you could come over. Oh, no, we couldn't come over. I couldn't come over. I, they, you know, that, I don't, that's a different person now. I don't know your mother anymore. You know? I wouldn't know what to say. Well, you know, and it, it, it's not the same person. Well, of course it is the same person. Mary is Mary, even if she has a bad memory. She's still Mary. She's just not the Mary that can necessarily remember your name. And you can't have a conversation that's based on, oh, you remember me, don't you? Well, no, maybe she does or not. But the point is you can have a conversation with her if she's walking around the neighborhood about the day, about the flowers, about the sky, about the bird, a lot of things. But folks need training for that, to be comfortable talking to someone with dementia and to kind of know what to say. And that's an important piece. So then there are the, the many places or people that Mary might bump into, Mary and Frank. One of them is the police, right? In a dementia-friendly community, every policeman knows how to recognize the dementia signs and knows how to interact with a person who has dementia, just like the folks in the neighborhood. So you're not necessarily, um, if you see somebody who is kind of wandering around, and as, as a friend of mine was, we were just talking, they were down in Martha's Vineyard, someone wandering around down the street with her coat but it, it, and her hat, but except that her nightgown's on underneath it and her slippers, and it's February, you know. Um, so you, you know there may be an issue here. So she actually called the police in that case, and the policeman um, came. And, and my friend, as my friend was telling it, there was a, it, was a, it was a difficult situation because the, the police came because she called 911, but at the same time, the local bus went by, and the woman started getting on the bus. And, and my friend said, oh my God, this is a bad. But then the policeman got out of the car and ran over to the bus and walked on the bus. And my friend said, oh, this is great. And then the policeman walked off the bus and the bus left. And she said, well, what happened? She went and talked to the policeman. The policeman said, oh, um, th that woman was fine. She, she said she was just going to like Chilmark, right? Well, of course, Chilmark was in the other direction. right? And, and so my, my friend said, but did you notice she had her nightgown on and her slippers, you know? So 
there, there are training issues, right? There are also some, some programmatic -ish things that you might be able to do. For example, there's a wonderful program called Safe Return that many um, police departments have adopted where they will, will encourage people who have dementia to sign up, literally, at the police station. Just name and phone number and a picture, and a picture. So that if, for some reason, the police find somebody that's wandering, they can know who that person is without having to figure it out or ask the person where they live, which they may not remember, you know. Um, there are some wonderful programs related to Safe Return that will actually, um, there are devices that you can just wear on you, right, that will allow people to find you if you wander away. And now the, in, the origi in their original form, they were like the bracelets, like people who would, would get if they're, if they're on house arrest or whatever, right? But many people won't wear those. But now there are, you, you can just get a little chip that you can put in the person's pocket who has dementia. And you know if they wander away, chances are they're always going to use the same pair of pants or the same coat. And so the chip's going to be there and so they can find them, right? Or um, one of the nice things in Massachusetts is that um, all across the state, every parcel of land, including the parcel where you live, um, is on an assessor's map, which is now on GIS, a, the Geographical Information System, right? And all of that is electronic. And one of the features of GIS is that once you have that so-called base map, you can add electronic data layers to that. So you could, if you knew, because the community were so dementia friendly that people were willing to say they had dementia, if you knew where everybody lived, you could put that all on a map. And that means you could also figure out whether there are people in that neighborhood, whether there's someone in that neighborhood who is kind of looking out for that person, which often there is. Often it is the spouse, or there's the neighbor, there's the person they always had coffee with. Coffee with. There's, there's a connection. And so you can figure out also a way that if there's a town emergency, if there's a flood, if there's a hurricane, there's a huge snowstorm, there's somebody in the neighborhood who can go check in with that person because they're not knowing there was a flood or a snowstorm, you know? So you, you can develop those connections. So there's a lot you can do with the police. Similarly, the fire department, the fire department. If you are a first responder, you need to understand how this disease works. Among other things, you need to kind of overcome some of the stereotypes. If you know someone who's on the fire department, and maybe this is different from my town, but you can, you'll talk to them and they'll tell you about the frequent flyers, always kind of with a guffaw. Oh, that's one of the frequent flyers. We're there all the time, right? Well, probably one of the reasons why they're there all the time uh, or possibly it's because somebody's got dementia. Those are the cases that come up. So you need to be trying to figure out how you interact with that person. If that person is having an emergency and on the floor and you're the first responder, the first question you ask them isn't what happened. Wrong question if you got dementia, you know. Um, so to kind of figure that out and to figure out whether you can, you can develop any kind of database of all of those people so that you know if you're going in, that maybe you're going in with a doctor. So there are a lot of things to, around the fire department. Um, what about the hospital? The classic case at the hospital. What about the triage nurse? What about the mother that is coming in with her son and the mother's all kind of banged up? This is a real case I heard a couple, no, maybe a month ago, with her son. Um, and so she's talking to the triage nurse and the triage nurse is saying to her, um, so what happened? Oh, nothing, nothing happened. I'm fine. And the son is going, uh, Alzheimer's, you know, on the side. But the nurse is continuing to talk to the mother because the, the, the protocol in the hospital is, for confidentiality purposes, you're supposed to be dealing with your patient, not some other person, right? So how do we deal with that? How do you have a hospital in which, and remember, in many of the hospitals, the, the same people are going a lot. There are frequent flyers to the hospital. Many of them have these issues. And if you live here in Hopkinton, chances are you're going to Milford Hospital, I would guess, right? I would guess a very high percentage. So, that, so a dementia-friendly community is one where you know how things are going to work when you go to the hospital, because that's a common place where an elder can end up. Same thing with the doctor's office, right? The, 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 your question in the doctor's office is, you've got nurses and you've got doctors. The nurses have to feel comfortable with these issues and with spotting them and dealing with them, and the doctors need to feel comfortable first 
on a regular basis when people are coming in for their annual or semi-annual or even shorter than that when you get older checkups, making sure that a memory test is a part of the checkup. That you kind of, so you start having some base information. Second, the doctor needs to be feeling confident enough about these issues to be talking directly to these folks saying, you know, based on the, in, the, you know, the information, you may have some issues, right? So you may, be trying, you may need to be trying to figure this out. Make sure your estate planning is right. Make sure you've got things in line. Um, you, you know, talk to your family, but also maybe you want to talk to a specialist. Because remember, 70% of the folks with dementia have Alzheimer's. 30%, three out of 10, don't, right? And so the question is, if you've got dementia caused by something else, what are the other aspects of that other disease that you need to be knowing about? For example, the most recent case that, that, that was that uh, Robin Williams, a famous old comedian who died, and the diagnosis apparently diagnosis was that he had Lewy body dementia. Lewy body dementia, what's that? Uh, I've often heard that referred to as the most common disease that no one's heard of. Several million people in the United States have Lewy body disease, right? One of the symptoms is dementia. Another one is hallucinations. Can you imagine Robin Williams getting hallucinations and having dementia, you know? So you can see why he committed suicide. So it was, a, it was, it, it was it's, it's, you need to be able to make sure there are specialists who can be talking with these folks, right, to really be helping them along. Uh, when, they go, when they go to the, when they go, every senior is going to the pharmacy. And guess what? There aren't that many pharmacies. If you added up all the pharmacies that people in Hopkinton go to, there would be what? Three, four. Folks there, there needs to be somebody who is once again trained to spot issues with, you know, of folks with dementia, um, to deal with making sure that there aren't drugs that they're getting prescribed for that are going to have a bad effect on you if you have dementia, and trained to go back to the doctor and say, you know, just to alert the doctor, say, you know, you may want to be dealing with this, because it's, it's a very closed system. Just like there aren't that many general practitioner doctors here, there aren't that many, um, there aren't that many drug stores. And by the way, this was done nationally in Austria um, in conjunction with the, with the Alzheimer's Association, the Austrian Alzheimer's Association. They found they had, it was, it was a wonderful result in terms of making sure that people who had uh, dementia were not getting just the in inappropriate medicines. Now, probably, at least for my clients, one of the, what do you do as, as you're getting older and you're retired and you're mostly at home because you're kind of not getting out a lot? What do you do? You're at home, you watch TV, you're in the yard, you walk around, you go to church, maybe, but you're, one of your big things may very well be every once in a while you go out to eat, right? And I know in Marlboro when that happens, you always go to the same place. It's called, a place called Kennedy's. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a place close here in Hopkinton, which is kind of the place where people go out to eat, right? Uh, and have been for years, and they'll all dress up, you know, and this is a big deal. But what about if Mary has dementia? Is she still comfortable going, right? Or, by the way, what about going to the local Dunkin' Donuts, which everybody has, right? And everybody's, well, most people stop at. I do, several times a day. Um, so in that restaurant, do the, are the staff trained to help you, even if you have dementia, to recognize it, to not have happen what happened, this was another story by, a, by a, a, a client, that she went into the restaurant with her mother, and her mother ordered a tuna sandwich or whatever, and the lady came back with the tuna sandwich a while later, and the mother said, oh, I didn't order that. And so the waitress, instead of picking up on the fact that this is an unusual thing, started arguing with the woman. Oh, yes, you did. You know, I have it right here. You definitely ordered that. Well, okay. And, and then, finally, when she realized that there was an issue, that the woman had a dementia problem, by the end of the, meeting, the, the meal was paternalistic. Wouldn't talk to the woman, would only talk to the daughter. Oh, your mother did a great job on that meal. Well, imagine how you feel if you're the mother, right? So to have restaurants where, there, where folks are trained, maybe where there's a special menu, you don't need to be having dementia, getting a menu with 50 items, right? Maybe you need a waitress, ideally. Oh, Mr. Bergeron, today, do you would like the chicken or the fish, right? Or even simpler, Mr. Bergeron, today, the chicken's really good. How about the chicken? What do you think of that, right? So, so that people can still enjoy this experience, not exactly the same experience, but still enjoy it. Um, um, maybe there are special hours that, you're, that the restaurant is specifically inviting folks who have dementia. Uh, I have a good friend who's been here, a woman named Tammy Pozzaricki, 
runs a place called Pleasant Trees, which is a day program for folks with, folks with early stage dementia. So she called ahead the restaurant in West Road, the Chateau, and said to them, look, I have this whole set of people. I'd love to have them and their caregivers all go out to eat together. But they've all got dementia. So could we all come over like at 2 in the afternoon, right? And can we do, instead of a regular menu, can we do kind of a buffet, you know? The, pe the people at the Chateau said, absolutely, right? They had, food was all set. They had waitresses that all understood what was going on. These people had a great time, which kind of leads to memory cafes. Maybe there should be a memory cafe. What is that? Well, actually, Tammy Pazaricki created the first one here in Massachusetts, but there has been kind of a national movement now towards having places where on a regular basis, once a week or once a month, folks with dementia and their caregivers can go. Benefits the, the, the folks with the caregivers because they get to know each other because sometimes then they may be able to help each other out. It also really benefits the person with dementia, right? Because now you have a set of people with dementia who are together and who can therefore kind of take, no, they under, they take each other less seriously or more seriously and trade stories and things. I know I've, 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 I've used this, this, this story before, but uh, as I mentioned to people, you know, I'm getting old now. So I was a child who went to college in the 60s. So without going into further detail, I would say that when, when people describe to me the, the early stage dementia effects, right, in terms of conversations, that sounds to me a lot like being stoned. So somebody who has had maybe a little bit of marijuana and they have this conversation. And you know, when, when from, from college, when that is happening and everyone's in the room and someone gets into that sentence that they get to the middle of and kind of forget where they're going and stop, everybody laughs, that's very funny, right? Now, but if somebody's in the room that has dementia and everybody else isn't kind of feeling in a good mood, you know, or is feeling like, oh, this is terrible, I have dementia, and that same thing happens, oh, that's really terrible. How terrible, they got lost in the middle of their sentence. Well, you know, and the person with dementia gets that, right? That's not one of the hardest things about dementia is knowing that you're kind of losing it and having to deal with how people are reacting to you and how you're losing it, right? So in a, in a, in a memory cafe, to some extent, there isn't that, right? And now there are increasing numbers of these that are happening in Massachusetts. Actually, the folks at Jewish Family and Children's Services of Greater Boston, located in Waltham, are actually coordinating these now. They've developed a website called The Percolator meant to basically allow folks who are running memory cafes to talk to each other and talk about you know, what they're doing and trading hours and stuff. Because wouldn't it be great if Frank and Mary, if there were five memory cafes in Hopkinton or around here. So every Saturday, two o'clock, you could say, oh, where, where are we going this weekend? Where are we going? It's Saturday, we're gonna go to one of the memory cafes. And by the way, there's this wonderful one um, in Minnesota that we found uh, called J. Arthur's of all things, that it's a restaurant that has become once a week, Saturday, two to four, a memory cafe. And they encourage people to come, right? And you know, what are, how many customers are they seeing usually on Saturday from two to four? Nobody, right? Or Wednesday from two to four, right? Um, so it's a business thing and they're, you know, they're doing okay. They're not losing money. This isn't subsidized. And folks get to get together once a week. They have music a lot of times or they'll have other stuff, you know, or a comedian or poetry or whatever. So it's just, a, so it fills out your life. So, it, so that at the end of your day, if you have dementia, uh, well, I'll give you, when my sister once told me, she, she, she and her husband, her husband go to Pleasant Trees because it's a day program. And so one day she, you know, they were coming home and, and my sister asked her husband, so how was your day? Oh, it was great. What did you do? I don't remember. Well, that's okay. You don't have to remember how your day was. The question is, how are you feeling? If you know you had a good day, you know you had a good day, right? So that's kind of the, that's the point of a lot of this. But what if, similarly in the grocery store, you know that Frank and Mary, no matter how old they are and no matter what else they're not doing, they're going to the grocery store. They gotta get the groceries, right? And Mary can handle that. But you want a grocery store where there's, the signage is as clear as possible where perhaps there is staff that is trained to help you figure out where, you know, actually, or maybe even go with you to find something, as opposed to saying aisle 12. If you've got dementia, this could be a real problem, finding aisle 12, and someone at the checkout, right? There is a, um, a chain of stores, actually, called Tesco, 
One of the stores is in Chester, um, uh, England, in the, the, uh, the United Kingdom. England and Scotland, as well as New Zealand and Australia, have done a lot with this and have been for a number of years um, because it's all financed through the National Health Service. Um, so the, the folks, the guy that runs the, the, uh, the, 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 um, um, the supermarket basically had, had all of his employees trained on this and has a special cash register that folks are kind of pointed to, you know, if, there's, if the person has issues with dementia. He did it because, you know, he, he's got a family member who has dementia. But he says what he's trying to create in the store are mental ramps. I love that term. Remember before uh, Americans with Disabilities Act and stuff, and you had a wheelchair, and there were a lot of places you couldn't go because you just couldn't get up those few steps. And then finally somebody got it, that the fact that you have a wheelchair doesn't mean you're, not, you're somehow less, right? That we can design that problem away with ramps. Well, you can design a lot of these problems away, too, with mental ramps, and that's what they're doing in England. In the bank, all of these folks are going to the bank. They always have gone to the bank. They're not crazy about the ATMs. They want to talk to real people. You need staff in the bank that can help them out, because banking is, can be pretty confusing anyway, right? You also need folks who are spotting if there's something that looks funny, right? This, because this is the place where you see the older person coming in with a niece or a nephew or somebody who is all of a sudden withdrawing $20,000 or getting their name on all of the accounts. And that may be just fine because the older person needs help, or it may not, or it may not. And so, for banks, there needs to be some kind, there needs to be training so that there's some kind of protocol or mechanism so that if there's something that looks funny, somebody can be alerted to that. Whether it's the Council on Aging or the police, it's somebody can be alerted to that, right? Probably, in, in my opinion, the Council on Aging, because I think in this world, the Council on Aging plays a big role. But just, just by the way, some, this was done uh, in New Zealand. There, was a, there were a chain of banks called Westpac. Um, that trained all of their employees across the system. There were 17 banks, and the person who runs the system had a person that had dementia, and so they, they decided to do this. Um, and they got all the managers together, and he started off the meeting and said, I read this article about it, and he said, so, so of the people who are here, anybody have any family or friends that have had dementia? 15 out of 17 people raised their hands, and so everybody got it. So what's nice about, I mention that because what's nice about this kind of initiative is that so many people have been touched by it. They haven't talked about it because it's dementia. But when you start trying to figure it out, you're going to get a lot of response to it. The goal it, for me is to make sure that there's some, a little sign every place that says Frank and Mary are welcome here. Frank and Mary are welcome here. Um, similarly in the mall, in the parks. These are the kind of places where people go. So a park can be an ideal place for Frank and Mary to be spending time, right? Because you can be there totally in the present, watching the kids playing baseball, right? Just looking at the flowers, just feeling the sunshine, hearing the birds. And these are public spaces, right? So the town can have a real stake in this, making sure that that space is safe, that there's a flat walking path, that the view is unobstructed so that people don't get lost, right? making it a special place for every citizen, including these citizens who may be using this space a lot. If you want to see what can be done, go to the website of the Seattle, Washington Parks and Rec Department, where they have done a lot of this, right? Where, they're not, where they've not only designed dementia-friendly parks, but also encourage walks, walking tours, accompanied by somebody either from the Senior Center or Parks and Rec. You know, think about the Memory Cafe, except you're going outside today, right? And taking a walk in the park, once again, with a group of people so that you have that advantage that there are a lot of eyes and a lot of ears around, right, to kind of be watching. And you're just having an experience that's in the present. Um, the same kind of thought process applies no matter what you've got. If you've got a little local museum, how do you train the docents? I know that that's, there's a program that they've been doing that at the Museum of Fine Arts. The first of those happened at MoMA, at the Museum of Modern Art in, um, in New York. And actually, a guy named John Zeisel, who runs uh, um, hearth, the Hearthstone uh, memory care units, um, there are actually several of them. One of them is in Marlboro at New Horizons at the Assisted, at the assisted Living, developed that program because they found that folks with dementia 
of course, can be very responsive to art because it's just totally in the present. It's looking at pictures, it's drawing pictures. What about the library? In a dementia-friendly community, the resources need to be there so that if you're Frank or Mary, you can be learning more about this. What's the role of the senior center? Well, the senior center already does a lot of stuff. It's probably doing exercise programs. It's doing other day programs. Is the senior center uh, the appropriate place for a memory cafe once in a while? I know other senior centers are doing that. Um, it's a great place to have caregivers coming together, a safe place where, fee especially if, if, like in Hopkinton, you've got such an active senior center that so many people already feel comfortable here. So it's a natural place for that kind of training. What about assisted livings? What, you know, what, what is the role of Golden Pond and of the, the, uh, the, the Beaumonts and of um, um, the ones in Marlboro, the ones all around? Or the new one that just got built in Ashland, the residences at Valley Farm that has a memory care unit. So the interesting thing about places that have a memory care unit is that means you actually have staff on shift 24 hours a day who are dealing with folks who have these issues. And at the end of every shift, they're get, typically they're getting together and having a conversation. How did things go? Oh, Frank, you know, we had this particular incident today and this is what we did and it really worked terribly and everything went downhill. And then someone else suggests, well, you know, maybe you should try this. So they're, they're, they're like laboratories for these kinds of experiences. So they become, therefore, great places to do training, right? And to get people together and to talk about those issues, as well as a great alternative for Frank and Mary to know about, so that if there's a point where they can't live at home, they know where they can go, because it's kind of like home, because it's close by. And finally, finally, um, what about the nursing home? Oh my God, the dreaded nursing home, right? Where nobody ever wants to go. Um, and so many elders have been so guilted out by their spouses who said, now promise me, promise me you'll never send me to that nursing home. And then of course, there comes a point where this happened with my mother and father. I mean, my father had a heart attack five days before my mother died in the nursing home. My father couldn't go to my mother's funeral because he was recovering from the heart attack. But, but he had been taking care of her at home. The stress of it, it was terrible. So you, the, for some folks, you need a nursing home. But it can't be like the nursing homes we currently have that are really big, right? That tend to feel very institutional. Don't have any, often any pictures on the wall. Now, there's a reason for that. And I, and I feel guilty that I'm part of the problem in this case because most of the people living in all those nursing homes are on Mass Health. Because I've told people, you can always qualify for Mass Health, which you can. And Mass Health pays crummy. It doesn't pay a lot of money for the, because it's supposed to be a poverty program. And so there isn't a lot of money in the nursing homes, right? So that's going to be a problem unless at the local level you do something. But you know, the nursing home doesn't have to look like that. It can look like this one in Alaska. Um, and it isn't because it's Alaska that it's especially nice. It, it's, a, it's a new form of nursing home. They refer to it as the greenhouse model, where typically there are no more than 20 rooms, um, and everybody's got a single, and, and the model is more of a halfway house model, where people are engaging with the folks who are there, encouraging them to help with meal prep, going out for walks, uh, as opposed to the traditional nursing home model, because the history of nursing homes is they really were invented as places for people who were not quite sick enough to be at the hospital or needed to be there for a long time. And so they feel a lot like almost hospitals, not quite hospitals. That's not what these folks need, right? So maybe in, in, that, in, in a dementia-friendly community, you have a more friendly nursing home and also one where people from the Council on Aging or volunteers or others are coming to see people that when you leave for the nursing home, it isn't like you cross the moat, you know, and bye, so it was nice knowing you, you're gone now, right? Let us know when you die. Um, but instead, people are engaged because who is in the local nursing homes? Guess what? People from the local area, that's who's there, right? Now, we talked about a lot of stuff, and then finally, what about Frank? What about Frank in all of this, right? What does Frank need? Because Frank, of course, is with Mary all the time, all the time, right? And he's pretty stressed out. And what does he do? And how does he react to the fact that Mary can't remember his name? Sometimes can't remember that it's her husband, right? So he needs a lot of education. And he needs a lot of support. And he needs a day off sometimes. He needs a life. 
Because if he doesn't have a life, I always tell my clients, if you've got a, a spouse with dementia, the worst you, thing you can do for that client is die. Because if you die, boy, that person's world is going to change totally, right? But Frank needs to be supported. So there are a lot of things that need to be done. There's training, there's facility, there's programs. There are a lot of little things. There are some big things, right? The point is, any of this can be done, but it's all going to take money. It's going to take cooperation and money. So then the question is, where does the money come from? So there are three possibilities. It can come from the sky. Oh, we can pray. I hope we get a lot of money, right? I hope somebody gives us a lot of money to do all this. That was the old Catholic version, and the kind of more sectar the more secular version now is, I hope there's a big grant someplace. I hope Bill Gates will give us a lot of money from Hopkins in Massachusetts. Well, I don't think so. I don't, you know, it's not going to come from there. As my mother would say, prayer is not a plan. Prayer is not a plan. Or maybe it's going to come from the federal government, right? a big barrel of money, which is possible. Maybe Bernie Sanders will give you the money, you know? Donald Trump, not so much, you know? So I don't think we're going to, we want to count on that. Now, there's going to be some money from there because a lot of money is already coming from there through Medicare, through Medicaid, supporting a lot of the nursing homes, supporting programs like the Frail Elder Waiver to keep people at home. So it isn't a matter of getting 100% of the money you need. It's a matter of getting enough to make that nice, the extras or the training and all these other things. So really, that money is going to come from the community, right? So if you're here, the question is, what do you want in order to make this a dementia-friendly community? And then uh, talking to the folks who are in the room who are saying, do I want to live in a dementia-friendly community? Do I want to live in a place where I know that if through luck of the draw, I get it, that I'm still going to be able to stay at home and not just stay at home, but stay in my town? I think the answer to that for a lot of people is going to be yes, and I think people will be willing to throw in some money for that, right? The problem, money follows good ideas. The problem is not lack of money. There is not lack of money in Hopkinton to do any of this. There's just, there just may be lack, it's just a problem of will. If you folks, you decide you want to do it, well, then you're going to be able to do it. So um, I mentioned all of this because as, as I mentioned, um, three communities now are actually going through this process of trying to figure out how to become dementia friendly. Among the things that we figured out when we went to Minnesota was that for this to move, move smoothly, these groups need to be staffed. And so um, uh, Bay Path Elder Services got a grant, actually, from the Metro West Health Foundation to provide a staff person to make these things move. And that's Cindy Cormier, who is here today. Uh, and so I wanted Cindy to be talking about how this is working in those three communities, just so you have a sense of it. Cindy. Well, as Arthur mentioned, I'm Cindy Cormier, and I'm working with Bay Path Elder Services. Um, I was hired to coordinate the three towns that are implementing. So I've been spending a lot of time understanding the process and uh, communicating that to folks. And right now we are, um, we've started in Hudson Marlboro and Northboro. And Come to be Dementia Friendly, that's the name of our effort we came up with. And it's a grassroots volunteer driven process. So it's not something that Bay Path is doing. It's not something that the senior centers are doing. It's something that the communities are doing. So uh, the first thing that we had to do was get folks together. So we did reach out to the senior centers, as Arthur mentioned, they went out to Minnesota um, because they had the connections to the community. So they were able to put out a blast to the community to um, get folks interested and to come to a meeting to learn about things. The way we're doing this is we're using um, the Act on Alzheimer's Toolkit. The Act on Alzheimer's Toolkit, you can see it online, there's a link to it in the, in the package. Um, it contains everything we need to go through the process to determine what does a particular community need. Um, right down to the agendas for the meetings, um, there's a wealth of information in there. And of course, the goal is to create a, a community that's safe and comfortable for a person with dementia. And it's also, by going through this process, it's not somebody coming down to a community and saying, you should do this and you should do that. Each community's needs will be different. And so these needs will be determined based on the community's input, which is a, a great way. Arthur's talked a lot about what a dementia community uh, looks like. Um, he mentioned like the memory cafes. Um, I'm a caregiver to my mom. 
And I always say the thing that I would like is a day off. And so by going to these memory cafes, it's possible that I could meet other caregivers and build a relationship and feel comfortable with them. And maybe we could trade off responsibilities. Maybe she could take my mom with her when she goes to the park and I'll do the same for her at some other point, similar to what the mothers would do in the neighborhoods. Take my kids for a day, I'll take your kids next week type of thing. So, um, there, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities with that in a community to uh, make some changes. As I mentioned, we're doing it in Marlboro, Northboro, and in Hudson. The reason being is they're contiguous and also they're somewhat different. Marlboro is a city, Hudson's kind of rural, Northboro's a little bit more affluent. So it'll be interesting to go through those. Um, we looked at the census for Marlboro, Hudson, and Northboro. It was the 2010 census. Um, and at the time, the population was 71,717. The number of folks over the age of 65 was 9,397. And based on information from um, the Alzheimer's Association, one in nine individuals over 65 has Alzheimer's. That number would be 1,043 in, the, in these three towns. That's based on 2010 census. And the numbers are growing. And as us baby boomers are getting older, those numbers are gonna get bigger and bigger. I also think that these numbers are a little misleading because I know folks have dementia that haven't been diagnosed. So are they being counted? Another few other facts is that Alzheimer's is the sixth leading death, sixth leading cause of death in the US, which I never realized. And it's the only cause of death in the top 10 reasons for death in the US that can't be prevented, cured, or slowed down. And in 2015, Alzheimer's and other dementias cost this nation $226 billion. So there's money around. Huh? So there's money around. Yeah, I wonder what they're well, doing with it. Right, right. Um, as I mentioned, we're using the Act on Alzheimer's Toolkit. That toolkit is a four-phase process. The first phase is convene. That's where we're at right now. We've had these community meetings. Lots of folks came in, um, talked about the program, and we've created from that, those groups of folks um, action teams. So each, each community has an action team. Um, those action teams are made up of folks from different walks of life. Um, we have, for instance, uh, healthcare workers. We have caregivers. We have, in Hudson, we have the police chief. And we also have another officer who is the senior liaison in town, which is great. Um, in Marlboro and Hudson, um, Walgreens has gotten involved. And in fact, I just talked to a guy yesterday who's managing all three stores, the two in Marlboro and the one in Hudson. We already had the folks from Hudson on board in the Hudson action team. And now he said, we want all three stores to be involved. What can we do? So I've got him now on your Marlboro action team. Uh, so, like I mentioned, we have fire, we have um, legal representation, we have um, the library, um, we have, um, a, a, I don't know if he's a priest or a minister, um, but somebody from a religious organization and who happens to be in a part of town where there's a lot of Brazilian folks, so that helps to bring in that population of people. Um, so. It's, they're great teams. We're just getting off the ground. Um, our next meetings are coming up at the beginning of April, and that's where we'll determine who is playing what roles and to start looking at the next phase of the process. The next phase is assess. That's where we um, survey the community. And in the Act on Alzheimer's Toolkit, there are 11 different surveys. And those surveys are based on the different sectors. So there's one for first responders, there's one for caregivers, there's one for the health side of things, all the different avenues. So we will use those surveys. Um, we'll go out and actually survey folks. It's not a matter of sending surveys out because return rates on surveys aren't so great. So it's based on, because we're gonna ha we have so many folks on the action team, you know, if it's a shop owner, he knows other shop owners. Or the restaurant owner, he knows the other restaurant owners. So we're hoping that they're going to say, I'll take that survey and I'll go survey Joe Smith that owns such and such a business. So that's how we'll get the survey results in. 
Um, once we get those surveys done, they're going to go to BayPath, and BayPath will use the tool that is in the Act on Alzheimer's Toolkit to analyze what the results are. And they will pass those results back to the action teams. The action teams will then look at those results and determine what kind of actions should come out of that. And again, those actions could be different for each town. Some of them will be the same. We probably will share uh, knowledge. That's part of my role is to make sure that that information is shared across those three towns. Um, you know, there may be some things that we develop that can be used across the board. So as I mentioned, we're using the Act on Alzheimer's Toolkit. There's the link to it. It's a great tool. You might want to check it out. Um, there's, there's more than just the toolkit there. Um, what you can look at is um, there's a document in there that shows out in Minnesota, the different communities, what they actually implemented. So you can kind of see what are we talking about? What kinds of things are they? There's also training on there. I saw some training for, for doctors, for medical professionals, which I thought was great. Um, then there's also the DementiaFriendlyAmerica.org website. They are a, uh, another effort that is more US-wide, and Minnesota is falling under that, and we're falling under that. They also are using the Act on Alzheimer's Toolkit. I think they've made a few tweaks to it, but it's basically the same thing. And then, of course, the Alzheimer's Association. And then this is the contact information for the three towns. And if you have any questions at all about the process or where are we with it, et cetera, feel free to contact me. My information's down at the bottom. And that's our Marlboro team, of which Arthur is a part of. And I think he has, actually has a pair of jeans on that has a rip. So he doesn't always wear a that's suit. For people who think that I don't have anything that I own except a suit. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So that's the goal. The goal is to have a place where Frank and Mary can live happily until they die. Every community is going to be different. Everybody wants to stay at home. That's what this is all about. So thank you for all of this. I want to, do, I want to talk a little bit more about one thing, because there is one piece of the law that you should know about um, that has just come up, and you need to know about it now because it could really affect a lot of your planning. The current law uh, regarding um, recovery by Mass Health of money that was paid on your behalf if you were in a nursing home uh, is that um, if you have, if you're Frank and Mary, and Mary has ended up in the nursing home, and she could qualify being in the nursing home, even though Frank and she still own the house, and they own the house jointly, and because Frank was still living it, there'd be no lien put on that house, uh, nor would there be any recovery against that house following Mary's death, because that property would not go through her estate. Similarly, many folks who are single um, uh, have, have done something with their house where they have transferred an interest in their house to their children, but kept a so-called life estate in the house so that they'll own the house until they die, but following their death, their life estate will evaporate, not go through their probate estate, and therefore not be subject to any recovery by mass health. Uh, those are the current rules. There is a section of the budget that Governor, um, um, well, that's a bad sign, <laughs> that the governor proposed, Charlie Baker. See, now I think I'm slipping away here. Um, and that budget is currently pending. Um, there are outside sections to every budget. What is an outside section? The, the budget contains a whole bunch of lines, which are simply line items that say, here's the amount of money I want for this. Here's the amount of money that I want for that. But then there are also so-called outside sections, sections the, which actually change the law, which change statutes, which change regulations. But, the, but since the effect of that change is it has a financial effect by perhaps increasing the amount of the government's revenue or decreasing the amount of the government's payments, they're all included as part of the budget. Well, this year, this budget contains something called outside section 11. And it would do two things to change the current rules. First, it would say that if you have been in a nursing home on MassHealth and you die owning an interest in real estate, even if it's an interest that would not be going through your probate estate because it evaporates at your death, MassHealth will have a claim against the value of that interest after you die. As to exactly how that's going to get enforced, it still looks a, pretty, a little bit vague, 
But the bottom line is, if you are Mary in that Frank and Mary case and you die, um, and you've been in a nursing home on Mass Health. Mass Health will have a claim for about 50% of the value of your property, even though Frank just became the owner of it. If you have kept a life estate in the property and you are 90 years old, then using current uh, actuarial tables, the value of that life estate is, is going to be about 10% of the value of the property. And as to that amount, that, uh, that percentage of the value of the property, Mass Health will have a claim against that. As to how that gets calculated and, and enforced, still not too clear, but they'll have a claim. S then, if you die, if you're the, in the Frank and Mary case, if you die and Frank becomes the sole owner of the house, and he dies the next day, so that that house is now going through the probate process, then Mass Health is going to have a claim against the entire house, because they're going to have a claim against all of his probate assets to get reimbursed for what they paid on Mary's behalf. These are gigantic changes from the way the system has been working for a long time. And remember, this claim against Frank's estate following Mary's death could be whether he died the next day or next year or 10 years from now or whether he remarries. Doesn't make any difference whether he moves out of state, right? This claim is going to follow Frank for the rest of his life as far as his probate assets are concerned, right? So these are big changes. So what to do, you, you want to you pay attention to this, right? If you ha already have a life estate or a joint tenancy and you, are, and, you know, and you are concerned about somebody going into a nursing home, this will affect everybody that applies for Mass Health long-term care or that gets approved for Mass Health long-term care benefits as of July of this year. Whether or not you've structured all of this stuff beforehand, there is no grandfathering here regarding any of this stuff. So you need to be paying attention to this stuff. Um, you need to be talking to your lawyer about it. You may also want to talk to your, your state representative or your state senator because this is the budget. There are many bills that get proposed in the legislature all the time, but they don't get passed. Nothing happens to them. They kind of float away, right? Thousands of bills get proposed every year. Only a few hundred get passed. But the budget always gets passed. This will get passed in some form and it'll get passed by about July, because otherwise the government's not going to have any money as of July 1. So it's going to get passed. The only question is, will this section in its current form be in there, right? And that's being determined right now by the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, and the, basically the way this works is the budget gets sent to the House first. House Ways and Means Committee considers it, makes recommendations, and then the House votes. Then it goes to the Senate, Senate Ways and Means Committee, considers it, makes recommendations, and it goes to a vote. Now, I have a trivia question. Here in Hopkinton, who is your state senator? Spilka. Karen, Spilka. Karen Spilka is your state senator. Do you know what her, what her job is in the, in the uh, legislature? She is the chairman of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. The place where this bill will last go before it goes to the governor, she chairs that committee. So to the extent that you have an interest in this, you may want to talk to your senator. And she is a terrific senator, very, very concerned about elder issues. She runs that big elder presentation every year, very concerned about elder issues. So if you've got concerns about this, you may want to talk to Senator Spilka. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, I appreciate the attention. We'll be back in a couple of months doing my, our, what I, what it, in many communities, is my annual Elder Law 101. We're going to talk about everything you kind of need to know uh, to deal with if you're, if you're getting old. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.